Genesis chapter 18, verses 17 through 19. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Thank you, Danny Moses. Appreciate the good scripture reading and the prayer and the songs led by Brother Philip today. Indeed, it is a privilege to be here. I want to wish fathers a happy Father's Day today. We know that foremost, this is the Lord's Day, first day of the week, Acts 20, verse 7, but it's also a day to honor fathers, past and present. As Brother Doug Mallory points out, I got a lot of good ideas from him on the lesson today. He said that today we wish to honor fathers, including those who are no longer with us in this life. So in this room, I know that we have godly fathers, but also there are those who've gone from among us, beloved fathers that were good and godly fathers, and I know that you agree with me about that. We honor them too. This is one of the things that man is taught to do, is to honor father and mother. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee. And thou mayest live long on the earth. Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 3. Today we want to talk about a father's responsibility. A father's responsibility. We have read a moment ago from Genesis 18, 17 and 19. This is before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in chapter 19. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing, that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Really, it should be the aim and prayer of every father to be like Abraham in this way, that God would be able to say of us that I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. That certainly is my desire, and I believe the desire of every godly father, that we want to be that kind of father. Brother Mallory points out, have you ever noticed that on Mother's Day we tell mothers how great they are, and on Father's Day we tell fathers what they need to do to be great? Well, there may be some <laughs> truth in that. But there are a number of descriptions given of a father. And someone has said, and very possibly true, that a boy loves his mother, but he follows his father. This places a tremendous responsibility on the father. You remember several years ago, the advertisement on TV warning against uh, cigarette smoking. There was a little boy out under the tree and uh, with his father, and his father was smoking, and I think the little boy wanted to reach in there and, and get a cigarette, and the caption was, like father, like son. I don't know if you remember that. I remember that. There's a lot of truth to that, though, like father, like son. But oftentimes the son does become like the father. Fathers have such an important role in the lives of their children and the wife. So very important. There's a man out at the Murray County Jail where I'm teaching Bible classes every Friday. And he told me the other day, he said, my mother left us or left me when I was just, well, I think you said, two years old. And my father died when I was 13. He said, I've had a rough time. You know, children need a good father. 
And also, I want to ask you to pray for those fellows out there. We've got one who wants to be baptized under Christ. Please pray for them. Let's think of the letter P this morning as we think about Father. <coughs> as the provider, as the protector, the punisher, and the pattern, for example. First of all, the provider. The Father is charged with providing for the family. Paul wrote to Timothy, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. And we have some fathers that this fits. They will not provide for their family. Oh, they know how to bring a child into the world, but after that, it's goodbye. Nowhere to be found. And not taking care of their wife, or the mother of the children, or the children. Paul also wrote to the Lord's church at Thessalonica, 2 Thessalonians 3.10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. You know, if that was followed, there would be a lot of hungry people out here walking around. Because we got some people that won't work. My mother used to say he wouldn't hit a lick in a rattlesnake. There's people like that. They will not lift a finger to work. They want someone else to work. But you know, work is key to our happiness. In Genesis 2, before the fall of man, God gave Adam a work to do. This shows that work in itself is not a curse, but a blessing. Genesis 2, 15, the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. We know that after the fall of man, when Adam and Eve sinned, that man's work became more difficult. Thorns and also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat, shalt thou eat bread. And nevertheless, work is a blessing. It is a responsibility of the Father to provide food and shelter and clothing for his family. The privilege of providing for his family meets some deep inner need of man and makes him feel complete. You see why a lot of men don't feel complete? Because they're not providing for their family. The Father, with the help of the Heavenly Father, from whom all blessings come, every good and perfect gift, James 1, 17, will be able to take care of them with God's help. Secondly, he is to be the protector. A well-known gospel preacher who's now passed away made this statement. He said that fathers need to study the attributes of the Heavenly Father that they may become like Him. Well, that was a good statement. We need to study the character of God and see how God is. God is righteous and holy. He is also gracious and merciful, loving and forgiving. The Father stands unwaveringly for what is right, but also has compassion upon His children. We look at our Heavenly Father as a strength and a refuge. Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The Apostle Paul declares that we are to be imitators of God, Ephesians 5, 1. King James says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. We are to imitate and follow God in His example. The Heavenly Father is to be respected and reverenced. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Matthew 6 and 9. But we note also that Jesus urged upon His disciples to pray often. The Father in heaven is approachable. Earthly fathers, while we need to be strict and upright, we also need to be approachable. We need to be those to whom our children can turn. Suicide, drug abuse, alcoholism, and sexual promiscuity are epidemic among teenagers. An estimated 20 teens attempt to end their lives every 30 minutes. Approximately 685 teens become drug users every 30 minutes. Some 23 teenage girls have abortions every 30 minutes. 
and more than 3 million American teenagers have been treated for alcoholism since 1980. And about 9,000 teenagers are killed each year while driving drunk. Now, I wouldn't say that all of this arises because of the absence of an authority figure, the father, but at least some of this can be laid at the feet of the fact that many fathers are not what they ought to be. And many families do not have that authority figure. And that's the way God meant for it to be. A father should be someone that his children can look up to. We know that fathers have to be worthy of and accept responsibility. A man inherits some respect, but most of it he has to earn. Wives are commanded by God to give this respect to the husband. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Ephesians 5, 22. Then in verse 33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. When a wife does not do that, and she does not show that respect toward her husband, she not only is disobeying God, but she is hurting her children and their pattern for the home and the family. But in like manner, the husband is to show regard, love, and respect for his wife. Ephesians 5.25, what a great statement this is. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for you. That's powerful. Verse 28, so all men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Again, a man who fails to do that is disobedient to the Lord, but he also is doing a great wrong before his children. But then thirdly, the father is the punisher. And I know that in today's society that may not sound very politically correct, but the Bible does teach punishment. And before I read a scripture on this, fathers and mothers too, of course, are to commend their children and compliment them when they do well. It's not to be all criticism. But there are some times that we do have to correct our children. That's just the way it is. We have to if we want them to do well and succeed in life. The wise man said, He that spareth the rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him be times. Proverbs 13, 24. The Bible teaches us that chastening and punishment is an indication of love. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he received. Hebrews 12 and verse number 6. Ephesians 6 and verse 4 in the American Standard Version. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but, but nurture them in the chastening and admonition of the Lord. But then, number four this morning, the father is to be the pattern and the example. He is to be one that everyone in the home can look to as a right example, including the wife. And surely the wife and mother is to be that too. But think about the father as the pattern. He is a great example. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, or chapter 4, verse 12. Paul said to the young preacher Timothy, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example that is a pattern of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And we can be that, friends. Not only are preachers like Timothy, but like gospel preachers today would be patterns, for example, but all of us are to be fathers, mothers, husbands, wives, grandparents, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to be that example, that pattern. You know, we can be the right kind of pattern example if we will follow the one who came to set an example for us. For even here in Tiberi, you call because Christ 
also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. 1 Peter 2, 21. Jesus said, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. John 13, verse 15. Then we turn over a few pages to another young preacher, Titus. Paul wrote to Titus in Titus chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. And all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. Look at us today. When people look at us, do they see a pattern of good works? Each of us, not just fathers, not just preachers, but all of us. Can they say, well, that, that man, he goes out and does good. Or that lady, she does a lot of good works. Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I believe in this congregation here we have good works represented. That there are people doing things during the week that, that a lot of times other church members don't know about. But you know God knows that. God knows what we're doing. But other people see us too. So we need to be a pattern of good works. In doctrine, that is teaching, showing uncorruptness, gravity, that is seriousness, sincerity. We need to be sincere. We often say, well, sincerity alone is not enough. That's true. We have to be right according to God's Word. What about these people out here that are going out and, and doing uh, terrorist acts? They think they're doing what they're supposed to be doing? We know they're wrong. God condemns murder. But some of them probably think they're doing what's right. They've been brainwashed since they were just wee little things. Teach that they should go out and destroy the lives of other people. But they're still wrong. We have to be right, but yet we must be sincere. This is one of the things that really cripples children spiritually is when they see members of the church and fathers and mothers who are not genuinely sincere and earnest about the Lord. Peter said, seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Unfeigned means not put on. Not fake, not make believe, but genuine, earnest, sincere love of the brethren. See that you love one another, he went on to say, with a pure heart fervently. Now the way to be sure that we do this with a pure heart is to be sure that we have a pure heart. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, 5. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Colossians 3, 16. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5 and verse 8. Indeed, we must be sincere and earnest. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of a contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Friends, at this time, I would like to turn with you back to the book of Joshua, chapter 24. And some of you probably already know where I'm going with this. That's fine. This is one of the greatest examples of a male leadership and of a father is the man Joshua. A tremendous example. He along with Abraham. Joshua, of course, came along many years later. He was the successor to Moses. He became the leader of the children of Israel. As you recall, Moses died before they crossed over Jordan and entered into the promised land, the land of Canaan. And Joshua took up the reins and he became the leader of God's people Israel. Now we come to the end of the book of Joshua, the last chapter, 24, before the death of Joshua. We read of Joshua in Joshua chapter 24, verse number 29. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. A very brief phrase there describes Joshua. 
But oh, how important it is. If we could be what it was said of Joshua, then surely all of us, boys and girls, men and women, would fulfill the role that God's given us in this life. These few short words, the servant of the Lord. Oh yes, Joshua was a great military leader before he became the leader of Israel. He's a tremendous military leader. You remember that in studying Old Testament history. And became even a greater leader when he led the whole tribes of Israel. He became the leader as a successor to Moses. But yet, what made him a great leader? He was a servant. He was the servant of the Lord. Jesus said, He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Matthew 23, 11. The greatest leader, the greatest servant who ever lived, the Bible said, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto him, but to minister, that is to serve. He gave his life a ransom for many. Matthew 20, verse 28. Jesus Christ, the greatest servant and the greatest leader who has ever, ever lived. But now, let's go back earlier in the chapter here, Joshua chapter 24. Verse number 1, And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and called for the elders of Israel, and for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. This is before his death now. He gathers them together. We notice that he said in verse number 14, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. There it is again. That's the way we're supposed to worship God, isn't it? God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. That is, from the inward man in spirit, earnestly, sincerely, genuinely, and in truth, according to God's word. That's the way they were to serve the Lord. He said, And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood. The flood there refers to the river, the river Euphrates. That back there where they were before God called Abram out of his home country. Get thee into a country, to a land that I will show thee. And he followed God's call there. If you're reading the early verses of Genesis chapter 12 and also in Hebrews chapter 11 as it relates the story back. But you know the forefathers of Abram or Abraham worshiped idols. Look at verse number 2 of this chapter. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood, that is, the river Euphrates, in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. So now, Joshua is issuing the charge to put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood, the river. And in Egypt, you know, they were back down there in Egypt some 400 years. They saw all those idols of Egypt, those pagan gods, and serve ye the Lord. Can you believe that some of these children of Israel still were idolaters? They were still worshiping idols? After all that God had done in bringing them out of Egypt and through the wilderness, and now even into the promised land, some of them still had idols put away? They did. Well, can you believe that? we we'll look at the church today. We've got idols in the church, don't we? Yes, we do. And I don't mean the Lord's church worships idols, but I mean we have members of the church who need to put their idols away. They need to put away their sexual idols, their materialism, their covetousness, their selfishness, their things of the world that they have not put down. Yes, we have members of the church. You know, our knowledge and the blessings that we have in Christ are greater than those people have back there. And we sometimes stand with our mouths gaped open. Well, how could they do that? After all God did for them, well, rightly so. We should be astounded at that. But what about the church of our Lord today? 
Jesus died and shed His blood. People who have been immersed in the Christ and washed in the blood of the Lamb, and then they go back loving the world, loving material things, wanting to do things their way rather than God's way. Covetous, materialistic, worldly, ungodly. Yes, we've got people in the Israel of God today that need to put away their strange gods. They need to put away their worldly ways. But then he said in verse 15, and of course this is a verse that's well known. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day. It's urgent. Choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, that is the river, Euphrates, and we talked about that a while ago, verse number two, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, Right here where you are in the land of Canaan, the promised land, these Amorites, these heathen peoples around you. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua was resolute. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now friends, that's what we have to be in this land today. We're surrounded by all these Amorites out here. I don't mean literally. But we've got a lot of pagans around here in Mount Pleasant, even don't we? Murray County. They're everywhere. All over the place. Everywhere you go in this world, there's Amorites, so to speak, that have their false gods. Are you going to serve their gods? Are you going to have their ways? Or are we going to be like Joshua? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua understood what it was, it was to be a true father, didn't he? He understood that serving the Lord is the key to it all. It is the key. As we close this morning, Moses said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Jesus quoted that, didn't he? It was the first great commandment, Mark 12, 30. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontage between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. You know, some people might say, oh, that's, that's hard. How can you do all that? Talk about the Lord and His Word all the time. Well, the answer to that question is simple. It's how you do it. You love the Lord. And you love the Lord as you should, as he said here, and as Jesus said, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And you love his word with all your being. You're going to study the word, you're going to know the word, and you're going to talk about what you love, aren't you? We love our grandchildren, don't we? They're easy to talk about. I can talk about my grandchildren all day. Well, that's good. Because we should love our grandchildren, shouldn't we? They're precious, blessed from God. And our great-grandchildren. And our children. But what about Christ? Are we not to love Him first? Jesus said, He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, verse 37 38. As we close today, every one of us here, whether we're fathers or mothers, whoever we are, let's make this determination. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, you may not be the head of your house, but you can do your part in serving the Lord, can't you? You may be the son or the daughter serving the Lord. You can be an example for your parents, your husband, your wife, your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, those around you. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the primary responsibility that a father has. Today, if we have any here as members of the church who need to come back and to make that resolve again, to repent, confess our sins, and pray God, Acts 8, 20, 24, 1 John 1, 9, James 5, 16, and make up your mind, I'm going to serve the Lord with all I have.
with all my being. Or, my friend, if you've never done that, why not begin today? That's the greatest blessing you can be for your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, your parents, for those you love so much, for your friends and those around you, and for the church. It's to be a godly child of God. That's the way to do it. We must hear and believe the Word of God, Romans 10 and 17. Come to Him in faith, Hebrews 11 and 6. Without faith it's impossible to please Him. And to repent of prayers, Luke 13, verse 3 and 5. Confess Christ Jesus, Son of God, before men, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Romans 10, 9 and 10, Acts 8, 37. Then arise to be baptized and wash away thy sins. Call on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, 16. That his blood might make you clean, Revelation 1, 5. And thereby put on Christ, Galatians 3, 27. Then let us be faithful unto death, that one day we might receive that crown of life, Revelation 2, 10. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If you need to come today, why don't you come while we stand and sing? <clears throat>